Here now is Solutionaries. Happy Independence Day, I'm Lewis Bolden. July 4th marks the birthday of our nation and a celebration of democracy. One of the key features of our democracy, voting. The right to vote is an important part of the United States Constitution. But who can vote and exactly how we vote are not very well defined. Let's explore voting by mail. Our Solutionaries team looked at how laws are affecting voter turnout in Texas. Nationwide, we've had a lot of more discussion. Elections and voting have become very politicized in a way that they just haven't been in a long time in America. Election officials should be working to stop potential mail ballot fraud. And those forces are at play in Texas as they are everywhere else. So SB1 was the voting law that passed in Texas last fall. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that the law is making it more difficult for people to vote. We want to get the NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton. On the Democratic side, a lot of the voters that I've talked to here tonight are really concerned about voting rights. They're concerned about SB1 and the changes to the election. Certainly there has been confusion around mail-in ballots. For example, um, People have had lots of issues with their mail ballot applications being flagged. This was not an issue that we had in previous elections. How did you feel when you, you, know, you saw that final 20% rejection rate, <coughs> you know, after years of when you have like 2 to 3%? It's tough. It, it, it's tough that um, that's not who we are. So many people are having their ballots flagged because the new law imposes requirements. Mail ballot envelopes now need to have the voter's state ID number or the last four of their social on the outside of the envelope. In this spot, under the flap. It's a spot some missed entirely. In particular, I spoke to older voters who were talking about challenges with mail-in voting. Now that the law required people to submit identification numbers that had to match what they sent in when they first registered to vote, which has proved to be very challenging. Hey, I just got this, uh, letter handed to me. This is from Secretary of, State, Secretary of State John Scott, who says that the uh, delay in Harris County voting, that the votes will not be tabulated by uh, tomorrow. Once again, there's some sort of election ballot issue in Harris County. You have both party chairs. They're completely frustrated. And yet on a typical night, you're telling the state you're not going to be able to count all the votes by 7 p.m. Harris County has never said that we're not able to return results over tomorrow night. Senate Bill 1 weaponizes, right, weaponizes all these claims, even these 30-year-old kind of mundane, outdated laws. We're scared to violate that because we as presiding judges, but are we going to jail? Tomorrow morning, we still may not know the results. All eyes are on Texas right now. Yeah. We're the first primary in the nation, so this definitely is a high-profile mess up. We're in a, a crisis moment in how local election officials handle these ballots. And the harder it is to convince people that it's being done well. I mean, we're here to facilitate this and get every voter. And we've built up relationships with so many of these people over the years. Um, so like I said, we're, we're working it, we're working it. And uh, with your help, we're gonna get there. Just because you get convicted of a felon doesn't make you any less of a human being. I was young and pretty much just made some bad decisions. At the age of 15, I lost my voter rights before I had them. I think that we're still living in an era of Jim Crow, no matter how you put it. Every American citizen, once they've paid their debt to society, deserves to have that right restored to them immediately. My name is Desmond Mead, and I am the Executive Director of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. FRC is an organization led by directly impacted people, or people with previous felony convictions, as well as family members who have loved ones that have been impacted by the justice system. To tell someone that in spite of the fact that you served your time and paid your debt to society, that you should not have a say in how your community or state or country is ran. It was something wrong with that. It makes you feel like you're no longer an American. It sounds to me like they're trying to suppress convicted felons, which 
are human beings, just like you or him. And everybody's got a right. You know, you want to talk about a moment? You want to talk, you want to talk about my wife, Sheena, running for office? Uh, she ran for House District 46, right? Getting all excited about it the weeks before the primary election. You know, and someone approached me and said, Desmond, I know you're excited that you're going to get the vote for your wife, right? And it was like they took a knife and just stuck it in the old wound and twisted it, reminding me, right, that I'm not even good enough to vote for my wife. is that it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, uh, it doesn't matter what background you come from, all of us believe in democracy. From the very beginning, right, I knew that this issue was more than just an African-American issue. It was more than just a, a, a Democrat versus Republican issue. Now, this was an all-American issue. The Florida Rights Restoration Coalition found over 67,000 former felons signed up to vote after Amendment 4 passed. But last year, some learned their rights were not restored and that their vote in the 2020 election had been cast illegally. I spoke with one of those former felons, a voter advocate and a former lawmaker, who all point to a broken system in need of solutions. Voter fraud. What is voter fraud? Uh, voting when you're not supposed to. Shortly after law enforcement officers started arresting 20 people around the state of Florida for voting illegally in the 2020 election. And now they're going to pay the price for it. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced the arrests were the result of an investigation by his newly formed election police. Before I propose this, and this was my idea. What he didn't announce. Why would y'all let me vote if I wasn't, uh, I wasn't able to vote? There was a common theme among the arrestees. Voter fraud, I voted, but I ain't fraud, commit no fraud. They didn't understand why they were being arrested. Oh my God. The solutionaries have learned most, if not all of those arrested, thought their rights had been restored because they were allowed to register to vote. They sent me a voter registration card. Including Peter Washington. That what made me think that I was eligible to vote. Or okay. uh, uh, my rights were reinstated. Did you intentionally cast an illegal ballot? No. Those same voters have gotten voter ID cards from the very government who is now charging them. Hi, I'm Neil Voles. I'm the deputy director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Got involved in the movement in 2015 and uh, helped lead the efforts to pass Amendment 4 in 2018. Ultimately, we're dealing with a data management problem. We should bring in the best experts we can and then put the systems and processes so that we can simply give somebody a yes or no within a short period of time once they register to vote. Voles says the state needs a centralized database where people with felony convictions can check their eligibility. The system is broken on the front end, and that's where we need to focus our solution. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, in many states, everyone can vote except people currently in prison. In 19 states, people with felony convictions can vote after completing their sentence and rights are automatically restored. So there's nothing they have to do. Florida is one of seven states where people with certain felony convictions like murder and sex crimes cannot vote states like Louisiana, states like Alabama, you know, you can go to a website, you can call somebody and get assurances and verification on the front end that you're eligible to vote. Here's how the state of Alabama creates a safeguard in the system. In Alabama, people with felony convictions that are not murder or sex crimes, after completing their sentences, first apply for a certificate of eligibility to register to vote with the Board of Pardons and Paroles. The wait is up to 44 days to process voting rights restoration applications. If the certificate of eligibility is not granted, the person is not even allowed to register. That alone could fix Florida's problem. The state of Florida could fix it. I'm Jeff Brandis, and I was the author of the implementing bill for Amendment 4. Brandis says under Florida statute, all of the people arrested were ineligible to vote because they were convicted of murder or sexual offenses. The Secretary of State's office just needs to do its job and compile the list of people who are convicted of felonies uh, or of sexual offenses or murder and let's start there. Brandis agrees with Voles that a centralized database would simplify the process. It's fairly simple if somebody is convicted of one felony in one county. Mm -hmm. 
it gets much more complicated when you have multiple felonies in multiple jurisdictions. Do you think correcting this is a priority for the state? I think it should be. They could have a website dedicated to how felons can get their rights restored. They could have a standardized process and a standardized receipt that you're eligible to vote. It's just a really a question of resources and how much resources the, willing is, the state is willing to put into solving these problems. The statewide prosecutor has since dropped the charges against Tony Patterson, citing information received from the Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections and the defendant's incarceration. Patterson is one of several defendants who have had their cases dropped or walked free after accepting a plea bargain. You can read more about those stories on ClickOrlando.com. Still ahead, life-saving solutions for the patriots who put their lives on the line for us every day. Can't say mental health is important, but not funded. Solutionaries will return in just a moment. For the past 247 years, people have been celebrating the July 4th holiday with parades, fireworks, backyard cookouts, and bonfires. For many first responders, July 4th is another night on the job, protecting and caring for our community. But who's there when they need help? Our Solutionaries team found groups getting results and saving lives. Stay with us, stay with us, we got you. We got you. Yeah, lift, 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 lift. When things go wrong, terribly wrong, we count on our first responders to get us through tough times. But what about them? What about their tough times and what happens when their job is to handle your issue, but they're struggling with their own? Experts are addressing the problem to ensure those caring for us get the care they need. First responders face daunting tasks, and they're called out on many of our worst days. When the dispatch dropped, it said, uh, daycare center on fire, report of people trapped. Staffing issues, or whatever the reason may be, is forcing our first responders to answer more calls. How many were inside? Can I I walked you out. All right. And the impact of calls like that may not be noticeable to you or me, but the cumulative effect does weigh heavily on the men and women wearing the uniform. And we saw that impact talking with Houston firefighters about a daycare where four children died after a stove was left on. It was chaos. The neighbors were all standing in the yard. He didn't say what happened. We had to pass the children out of the window because we couldn't go back the way we came because it was very hot and smoky and the children didn't have protective gear like we do. Uh, all the kids had to be resuscitated with the exception of two. I was more upset that the kid that I had that I couldn't save. So yeah, that's, that's emotional. Then, you know, every other, everything else that happened you know, so you have to have somebody to vent to. So if we call first responders during our worst moments, who do they call when they need the help? The last thing you want to do is lose them to burnout or to psychopathology that is part of the job. Witnessing this much stuff and, uh, you know, witnessing these types of events can be as bad as experiencing them in terms of mental health. And the cum cumulative effect is anxiety and depression. We sometimes call it post-traumatic stress disorder, could even be adjustment disorder, such that you have problems sleeping, you might uh, avoid things you used to like to do, you might not be able to function uh, as a spouse as well as you used to. Nationally, according to bluehealth.org, eight first responders became victims of suicide since the beginning of this year, 2023. In 2022, 184 lives of law enforcement, dispatchers, firefighters and EMS, and correction officers were claimed by the illness. So how do you stop it? Well, the Houston Fire Department got funding for an in-house mental health specialist. For me, I had Dr. Buser on speed dial. Um, you know, it was paramount. I mean, he kind of puts you back together, you know, because um, you feel like, you know, you're almost crazy, you know, his thoughts or the, the dreams or the smells that keep recurring. Houston Fire only has funding for one doctor, leaving gaps in their support system. So HFD found success by leaning on each other. That's where we've come in with the peer support on our end uh, to try to fill those holes, but that's not the way it should be. You can't say mental health is important. You can't say um, 
the behavioral mental health PTSD of our Houston firefighters and paramedics is critical, but not funded. From Orlando to Detroit to San Antonio or Roanoke, our peer support team programs across the United States are working, as well as uh, more and more counselors are beginning to understand our world, and that's, that's critical. In order to be their own keepers, they learned the warning signs. As an officer now, I look for that in my guys, you know, young guys, seven-year guys, got little kids, making kids, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's for, for everybody, but, um, you know, once you've done it enough, you know, you're able to see guys that are exhibiting those problematic symptoms. From previous suicides or depression thing that's going on with uh, other guys in the department, they start off mostly by joking. And when you get to the point of they have an actual plan, then yeah, that's a problem. Because having a plan then lets you know they've walked this through. They've seen how it ends. Many people are afraid to ask that about, uh, are you afraid to kill yourself or thinking about killing yourself? Because they think that will put that idea into their head. And, and out of the numerous people that I have interviewed, that was never the catalyst. They had more deep-seated issues than you asking them that question. Experts like Jeff Dill say, Peer support programs are working by lowering the number of first responder death by suicides. He says education, overcoming the stigma, and getting more resources for mental health specialists is needed. So what can you do if your loved one may be experiencing something like this? People need to know that there are treatments that work. We won't make it better. We won't take the memories away, but we'll take the memories from feeling overwhelming to feeling bad. Bad things aren't going to make you feel good, we admit that, but we can take it and make it so that it doesn't ruin your day every day. Peer support is a key way to track the mental health of our first responders and help treat the problem. If you or a loved one needs help outside your agency or department, reach out to one of these resources. Here in Central Florida, we found more solutions for first responders, the 211 Mental Health Helpline. Eric Von Aiken met one first responder who's answering the phone and saving the lives of brothers and sisters in uniform. Drop the gun! It is a reality for first responders. More of them die by suicide than in the line of duty, despite the danger and risk. This is very serious to me. Uh, it's very real. As I said, I lost my son to suicide. I was suicidal. Brandon Hicks almost lost himself after losing his son to suicide in 2007. He's a retired bailiff, patrolman, and SWAT team leader. And now... Hey, this is Brandon with Here Tomorrow. How can I help? Peer support counselor. When other first responders, his peers, dial 211. Tell me a little bit about what's going on today. He gets on the phone with them. Before this, what was it like? It was very little. 2014 is, is when I retired. Uh, what led up to my retirement was uh, degrading mental health. Finally, in 2021, Florida offered another option for any first responder anywhere in the state. First Lady Casey DeSantis announced $12 million for six behavioral health facilities across Florida. Here tomorrow, this is Nicole. To put peers at the other end of the 211 hotline for when first responders call in crisis. They were almost having to recount everything that happens on a daily basis to them, to the therapist that was not familiar with what first responders do. LSF Health Systems, which covers Northeast Florida, including Volusia and Flagler counties, is one of the six facilities hired by the state, which hired Brandon and his nonprofit counseling center here tomorrow. They gave us this video of their call center in Jacksonville. Literally, you just Google, you click on the link for here tomorrow, you schedule an appointment, no cost, we don't ask about insurance, we don't take it. Brannon, as a former cop, knows what he knows, of course, but he got 144 hours of training from LSF to make sure he knows what to say on the phone to get results together. You feel like you've saved lives? Oh, we do, every day. Yeah, hands down. Right now, Brannon and Here Tomorrow only get the calls from first responders in Volusia County, Flagler, and Northeast Florida. But no matter where you call 211 from, you will get a peer support network. Thank you for watching Solutionaries. If you want to see more, get the new 6 Plus app for your smart TV to start streaming. I'm Louis Bold, and happy Independence Day to you and to the heroes protecting our lives and our liberty. Take care.